Hello Joe. thanks for speaking to me. Could you please tell me a bit about how you first became involved in the health industry and how your career has developed over the years? Um, look, I suppose I obviously studied medicine after um, finishing high school and I, I suppose a lot of people are influenced a little bit by your parents and my mother sort of thought it was a good idea for me to, uh, to study medicine and uh, look, I was interested in, in that and you obviously toss up a few things and um, obviously that was ooh, close to... 30-something years ago now that uh, started in university. Um, and then, obviously, after you know graduating, working in the hospitals for a few years, and I went into general practice, or, or what in the United States is, is called sort of family medicine, um, because to me, I suppose, I was almost always more interested in sort of dealing with, with people, perhaps, more than just dealing with disease. So in a lot of specialties, really the focus is on a particular organ or a particular condition, whereas in... Um, primary care, you're really more focused on the, uh, you know, on the individual person, and you know, there's a lot more variety in that. Um, look, in addition to, particularly to the 1990s, running my own practice, I've done different consultancy, different roles. Um, I did some stuff in one of the hospitals here in the admin for a few years. Uh, I was involved uh, quite extensively in the early 2000s in the setting up and managing of, of medical centres and some amalgamations of practices. And then um, um, through the 2000s, I've been involved in some different health businesses where um, both involved in running with and also putting some consultancy input in. And more recently in um, promoting health through writing and also media work on radio, TV and also in the newspaper. So it's been quite varied. Um, which is which is good. That, that's something I've always enjoyed. It's just the different variety through the course of the week. And your website, drjoe.net, provides do-it-yourself health and healthy living information. What inspired you to set up this website? Mm, look, I suppose it came in parallel with my writing a book, which was which is also called Do It Yourself Health, and that in turn came about with me really starting to think that a lot of uh, the chronic and um, lifestyle-related illnesses that we deal with these days have similar causation, and it really comes about how people are living their lives in terms of the foods they're eating, um, not necessarily exercising. Um, you know, there's a lot of very basic stuff that people can be doing. And for me, it's like, yes, I, I can say this to one person at a time through the, you know, through the surgery and through consulting, and, and that's helpful. But that in writing a book, setting up a, a website that there's capacity to talk to more people at the same time. And whilst everybody's health issues are a little bit different, there are some real common points that apply pretty much across the board and that uh, the power of the internet means that you can talk to a lot of people and provide them with information that they obviously can come and look at and obviously they're then free to either you know, take it or, or, or not take it. But to me, it was about being able to get a message out to a much broader audience and do that probably in a, in a much more efficient and effective way. And you also have a do-it-yourself health FAQ on your website. So what are some of the biggest concerns that people contact you about? Well, again, it often is the, the, the very basic stuff to do with, you know, what sort of things should I be, be eating? Um, what is the difference between good fats and bad fats? You know, what about carbs? I hear some are good, some are bad. How can I tell the, the difference? Um, you know, why should I be doing exercise? How do I make the time to do that? You know, what do you regard as the ideal diet? And I talk quite a lot about sleep as well. So people sort of ask, well, you know, what's the right amount of sleep and, and why is it so important? So like with a lot of things to do with human beings, it's often the the very fundamental and basic things that cause confusion and particularly you know in this modern age we tend to think there has to be a complicated answer to everything whereas in fact really to go back and focus on the basics with our health um, you know health is going to be better for us and therefore again with the FAQs it's about really trying to get some very critical and important information out there and, and cut through some of the I suppose, mythology and, and some of the ways that it's made harder for people than what it really needs to be. What are the biggest challenges in using social media as a physician? Um, what do you think can be done to overcome them? Yeah, look, and I think that you know, that's a really good question and it's different, I suppose, to, for different physicians as to why they want to use it and in what countries they might be. Now, for me, it's not particularly about trying to promote my own personal practice. For me, it's more about getting a message out there. 
Um, there's been a lot of talk um, to doctors about being careful, about being friends with you know, patients um, in terms of providing any medical advice online. And obviously you can't provide medical advice to people that you don't know and you can't advi- uh, provide medical advice through forums like Facebook or Twitter. But there's a difference between advice, which is saying to somebody, this is what I think you should do based on your individual circumstances, and providing information. Um, and I think for you know, physicians on the web, I don't, think there's any, I don't see there's any issue with providing general information. You can't say that in, in putting something on the web that says, like, we should be eating more fruits and vegetables and drinking less you know, soda, um, I don't think anybody can say that that is health advice or telling people what tablets to take. That is providing health information. And it's also done in a way that is not prescriptive. It's not saying this is the amount that you should eat and this is when you should eat it. It's saying these are the sorts of broad concepts that you should be looking at and applying in your life and obviously using that in the you know, context of your own circumstances. So you know, it is about keeping it obviously very professional. It is about keeping a very strict line between general information and seeking to diagnose and or offer treatment. You cannot do that on the web. If you try to do that, you're going to get into, into trouble. If you're providing general information uh, for people to, to consider, then I don't see there's any problem. So there are, there are lines not to cross, and I don't personally see that you know, it's that difficult to um, you know, be able to stay on the right side of that line. One of your most recent articles on your website is about health mobile phone apps. How important is it to keep up to date with the latest technology trends in order to continually reach people successfully? Mm, Look, if you don't keep up with modern technology, I suppose it is harder to reach people. You know, these days, people aren't going to um, necessarily get stuff on stone and parchment like they might have done in the, uh, the middle or the dark ages decreasingly people, I mean people are still reading newspapers but that's less so and just in the last couple of weeks there have been major changes um, in the media landscape in Australia with regards to newspapers. I know some papers in America are now printing only a few days a week and they're putting out uh, iPad editions. Um, Mobile technology is expanding at a rapid rate so even some people these days don't even necessarily have a laptop computer they'll do everything through their mobile phone or through their you know tablet device so if you want to reach people you have to be where they are it's no use saying i'm going to put this information in a format um, that was appropriate in the 1960s people will say well that's great we're just not across it Um, so it, it is important to put any information that you want to get to a mass market where that mass market is now i don't think that magazines and newspapers are are dead yet so I still write a column for a newspaper but I also know that um, increasingly and more so with the upcoming generation they want to get their information in their hands in their tablets and their um, you know their their iPods and their phones Um, so you need to put information in that um, you know in that environment if you want to reach people otherwise you really are just shouting out in a in, in, a, in a vacuum and you might have great information but if nobody's hearing it it's not much use to them and, and you're not really doing anybody a service. How can pharma better engage with physicians in your opinion? That's a, um, that's a really good question and I think at the moment the, um, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry like a lot of industries is having to examine the business models that it's had over the years and um, business models that worked in the 1980s and 90s uh, may not work quite so well in the uh, you know the 2010s or the teens whatever we call this decade i think the days of relying on blockbuster medications appear to be behind us with patents running out on a number of, of medications um, i think the days of taking doctors out to fancy restaurants or paying for trips um, i think are also a little bit behind us there's more exposure of that sort of behavior and rightly or wrongly neither um, insurers nor governments nor the public um, <clears throat> really are prepared to accept what is seen to be a form of um, inducement. So I think there's going to have to be more transparency. Um, look, I think ultimately there's going to be a little bit of a, 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 a sort of, as happens in industries, a bit of a washout. Um, some companies may well fall by the wayside if they can't change their ways. I think there's going to need to be perhaps a bit of a re-engagement and it's going to be on the basis more of a, a partnership. And I think what's perhaps happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that the 
the medical agenda has come to be a little bit uh, dominated in some respects by the interests of pharma and I think what we probably need to see going forwards is a bit of a, a recalibration whereby the pharmaceutical work industry works in conjunction with, with doctors but they are more in a partnership rather than a sort of... Um, trying to think of the best word to describe this, but the situation at the moment where people are seen to be, or doctors are seen to be under the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, um, it shouldn't be either influencing the other. I think both should be having an input into the health system. And to conclude, in what ways do you think patient care can be improved further in the future with regards to physicians and the healthcare industry? Mm, look, there's a large amount of room for improved efficiencies. I think countries right around the world are grappling with issues of, of waste, of duplication, of record keeping, of how third party payers can uh, can get better value, um, and how you know, individuals and patients themselves can negotiate what has been made into an increasingly complex system. Um, so I think better you know, information systems for you know health consumers or patients in particular is going to be important. Um, I certainly think that systems need to be reconfigured. The, the the health system as we have them at the moment are essentially based on a, if you like, a disease model system that doesn't really exist anymore. Most in most countries, the systems are still geared around hospitals, and they in, were originally developed for acute injury, so you might or, in, or illness. So you might have had an infection, like a, a chest infection. You might have had a broken bone or needed some operation. Now, in days gone by, there are a couple of, of possibilities. You either got better or you died. But either way, it was going to happen reasonably quickly. Today, with chronic illnesses, the, the hospital system really doesn't cope very well with that because that's not what it's designed for and our health systems are still very top-down driven um, and really the change in disease patterns compared to 50 and 100 years ago has not been kept up with by a healthcare system which still works on, I suppose, a model which was more appropriate 100 years ago. So there will need to be some changes. The current systems that they are not sustainable. There's talk about the United States Medicare and Medicaid systems running out of money, you know, as early as 2020. Um, in, in the UK, there's issues with the NHS and its funding. In Australia, we're looking at the same issue and across Europe, the same. So the current systems are very unwieldy. They're expensive. And at the other side, a lot of patients are saying it's not really delivering what we want. So there do need to be some structural reforms. And the focus is going to need to be on helping people to keep healthy rather than just focusing on fixing them up when they're sick. And I'm not saying that that doesn't need to happen. It does. But we really need to have a much bigger focus on what we can do to keep people um, healthy, to prevent them getting sick, and to support them um, you know, in a community setting. And that's going to need to be a major paradigm shift. Thank you for your insights, Joe. It was lovely to speak to you.